So I'm really delighted to introduce um, Professor Sahid Adarinto. Um, Professor Adarinto received his BA from the University of Ibadan and his MA and PhD from the University of Texas at Austin. And he is currently professor of history at Western Carolina University. Um, if anyone has any kind of interest in promoting a sense of inadequacy when it comes to their own personal research production, I encourage you to take a look at um, Professor Adorinto's CV. It's, it's simply astounding. Um, he has authored or edited eight books, including the forthcoming Animality and Colonial Subjecthood in Africa, which is um, going to be published by Ohio University Press in their African, New African History series this year. He's also authored on um, Guns and Society in Colonial Nigeria and When Sex Threatened the State, which um, was published by the University of Illinois Press and was the winner of the 2016 Nigerian Studies Association's Book Award Prize for the most important scholarly book or work on Nigeria published in, in, in the um, English language. Um, in addition to these eight books, he has also published 37 journal articles and book chapters and an additional 40 encyclopedia articles. Um, I think it's all, also worth noting that Professor Dorinto is the founding president of the Lagos Studies Association. And today he's gonna to talk to us about animals as diasporic bodies in African studies. I'm really looking forward to your talk and to the conversation that follows. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Professor Dorinto. Okay, can you all hear me? Good. Um, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Uh, Kodesh for that great uh, introduction and uh, Diana Ifamakinwa for organizing this and, um, and everyone for taking time to attend this uh, webinar. I, I would like to start by saying that idea for an, an academic book does not come like a magic spell. Uh, it doesn't occur instantaneously without a trace or without a process. In most cases, it's a product of encounter with related knowledge and unfinished business from previous projects, the search for new frontiers of knowledge and access to a dense trove of data. All these get back to my book, Animality and Colonial Subjecthood in Africa. I first began to think academically about animals while I was working on my book on the history of guns, published in 2018 by Indiana University Press. Writing about the use of guns for hunting first introduced me to environmental history and human animal affairs. However, it, it didn't take me so long to realize that hunting was just one of the numerous sites of human animal encounter and that to write a book solely on hunting either from local or imperial perspective or to write the history of nature conservation would amount to reproducing similar scholarships especially from eastern and southern africa but it didn't take me long to look for innovative ideas to situate the book in extant literature all my sources explicitly point to the central thesis of my book, that is, animals like humans were colonial subjects in Africa. Yet, the idea of colonial subjecthood is not the totality of the narratives of the book. And its primary agenda is not to insist that humans and animals encounter the same experience across space, time, and even circumstances. Rather, it identifying specific experiences that connects human and animal lives, all in the bid to stretch historical narratives beyond existing paradigmatic boundaries. One of such narratives include diaspora and movement. African scholars are focused entirely on humans as subjects of diasporic discourse, history, and experience. Culture and identities, I argue, are not the only elements that humans introduce to their new homes when they move. They also move with their animals. For a long time, biologists, 
forensic scientists and anthropologists or archaeologists specifically have explained the transformation of the modern world from the perspective of introduction of plants and animal species from across the world. However, historians have played a limited role in this discourse, which has the capacity to expand true social history that is respectful of political, economic, and ideological transformation, our understanding of the ties that bind human-animal history. A historian is more concerned about animals as subject and agent of diaspora than as mere objects, specimens, pathogens, and even lifeless souls, as we see in the scholarship coming from science. In this presentation, I argue that animals were also important subjects in the circulation of ideologies and practices of movements, migration, and the diaspora. I argue that they should be considered as diasporic bodies within and outside Africa. Although the biographies of dogs, cattles, lions, and gorillas can be found in many works, they have not been thoroughly situated as part of the movement of ideas and human body. So for me, in this presentation, I, I will use the biographies of dogs, cattle, lions, and gorilla to engage with the subject of diaspora and cultural introduction. I engage how non-human creatures transformed human-animal relations in their new homes. This lecture concludes by offering some theoretical and methodological frameworks for inserting animals into the discourse of African diaspora beyond the practice of analogizing animals with humans. So let's talk about the first animal today. Uh, can I, my slide shows. Between 1964 and 2009, generation after generation of school children in southwestern Nigeria encountered nature and reprocessed their own humanity through Aruna and Imade, two western lowland gorillas whose fame traveled far and wide. Excuse me, Professor Adarin, so you are not sharing your screen. Oh, okay. Let's see what's going on. How about this? Perfect. Perfect. Okay, so I'll take that again. Between 1964 and 2009, generation after generation of school children in southwestern Nigeria encountered nature and reprocessed their own humanity through Aruna and Imade two Western lowland gorillas whose fame traveled far and wide. These animals exemplify what evolutionaries have insisted for a long time, that there is a developmental affinity between humans and apes. Yet, it was their performance of human traits more than the problematic evolutionary theories that amazed everyone who met them. At the peak of their productivity, Aruna and Imade enjoyed and obeyed commands in Yoruba and English. They swim, and they even express contrasting emotions that challenge humans to rethink their alleged superiority to animals. But Aruna and Imade's story did not begin in captivity. Their story did not begin in the zoo, where they, where they were kept until they died. In December 1964, they were captured in the forest of Cameroon by foreign animal traffickers and offered for sale at the University of Ibadan Zoological Garden. 
The animals, when they arrived at the zoo in 1964, looked very small, miserable, and frightened, according to zookeepers. Instead of buying the animals from their traffickers, zookeepers took them and called the police on their captors. They then went on to build a massive cage, which is what you can see. This is the home of the, the home of the gorillas, a massive cage and a water move enclosure for them. Aruna died in 1995, followed by Imade 14 years later. Today, the embalmed bodies of the apes on permanent exhibition at the University of Baden Zoo reminds people of the, of the animals who left an indelible mark on their own childhood. So let's talk about the cartoon. In 1906, two English bulls named Bunje and Prince were imported from Great Britain for a farm in Onitsha in southeastern Nigeria. But the farm, according to veterinarians, was not, a was not a success. And regrettably, the animals did not produce any offspring. They didn't produce any calf. A year later, the governor of Lagos colony named Walter Egerton presented Prince and Bunje to two local chiefs, namely the Emir of Ilori and Alafio you know, for you, respectively. Neither animals lived long with their new owners. Bunje died in 1907, followed by Prince, who was much younger, in 1908. So the question we should ask is this. Why were Prince and Bunje brought to Onitsha, even though Nigeria had a large cattle population? The answer to this question is not far-fetched. Animals and plants were an integral part of British ecological imperialism that sought to transform the natural environment of the colonies to meet the material, symbolic, and aesthetic proclivities of the colonialists through imported metropolitan stocks. All animals and plants were not of equal material value in the colonial ranking of livestock. For the British, metropolitan livestock and plants ranked higher than colonial counterparts because they were considered to be the product of a much more advanced British society. One of the earliest concerns of the British in Nigeria, as in many parts of the continent, was the so-called small size of local livestock, whose utilitarian value was considered to be limited. And the introduction of the English bull, according to veterinarians, would initiate a genealogy of extravagantly formed prize cattle that could serve multiple purposes as transport animals and of course that can produce meats and could produce milk while also producing hide and skin. Imperial animals like Prince and Bunje were also victims of empire building. Their lack of immunity against African pathogens largely account for their high mortality. But of course, the field experiment did not stop the importation of foreign stock or foreign animal stock into Nigeria. And the photo you're seeing is from the 1950s. Throughout the colonial period, foreign animals were imported into Nigeria, all in the bid to increase the size of cattle. At every point in time, veterinarians have believed that the project of mixed breeding of cattle either from Africa or from Europe or, or elsewhere, would increase the yield of animals. And I like this photo, not only because it shows the movement of these animals to add to Nigeria, it's also because of the title. The, the, the photo is titled Immigrant, something that suggests significantly that even in the 1950s, producers of knowledge, journalists also believe that animals like humans can be immigrants. So now let's talk about Loja and Prince. In 1925, two lion cops named Loja and Mary, presented to Prince of Wales during his visit to Nigeria, arrived at the London Zoo. 
A film footage of the animal arrival featured children who were fascinated to see an uncommon creature. A media announcement of the animal's arrival reads, baby lion cubs, newly arrived from Nigeria, thoroughly enjoying uh, their freedom in the sunshine. This is, for me, again, problematic. It's problematic because we see the ways in which the colonialists were extending the idea of colonial paternalism on animals. The assumption that the animals were freer in the zoo than in the wild, or the assumption that by taking the animals away from Nigeria and now putting them in the London Zoo, they are free. And it goes back to all the rhetoric of colonialism, which, which institute or which is always about the fact that the colonial subjects are better off being colonized. So in the case of Mary and Loja, we see the ways in which taking them away from Nigeria, putting them in the zoo was considered as part of the rhetoric of freedom. And joining their freedom in the sunshine is more problematic to me than I could uh, imagine. The Nigerian, uh, the Nigerian wildlife in the Metropolitan Zoo were fed with special meals. You know, quite different from what they would eat when in, 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 you know in the wild. They were exposed to new routines, and of course, they were given names and became part of the spectacle of imperial objectification of colonial bodies. So again, when we talk and think about uh, objectification of colonial bodies, in most cases, this doesn't come to mind that when when metropolitan when colonial animals when animals are taken away from the colonies and and um, and put in metropolitan zoo. They, those animals are also performing certain uh, certain functions. They are performing colonial subject to. They are performing all the rhetoric and all the objectification of that comes with the gains of empire building. So let's move to the dogs. The diaries and uh, memoirs of early colonial officers take us into the lived experience of dogs as imperial co-agents. So the argument I'm making in this part of the book is that dogs were also co-agents of imperialism. And I will try to explain here, and of course, elaborate explanation is in the book. Aside from the basic, aside from basic supplies, such as food, medicine, and guns, early colonial administrators saw the dog as a vital tool and companion in their tropical adventure. Uh, we can see some dogs here, this is one as part of their colonial adventures. The animal's experience were thus deeply intertwined with that of their owners. As they voyage across the Atlantic Ocean and many terrains, traveling on trains, enjoying beautiful gardens in government homes and segregated communities. From Frederick Lugard, who sailed out of Liverpool in July 28, 1894, with a Grand Bull Terrier, and another colonial officer nicknamed Langelanga, who came to Nigeria in 1908 with Peggy, a Spaniel. To another lady, this time the wife of a colonial officer named Constance Larry Moore, who also came to Nigeria with three dogs. The experience of dogs as co agents of uh, imperialism is filled with affection, charm, loss, and all other things related to foreign adventures. Why many colonial officers brought their dogs directly from Europe? Some acquired their dogs in Nigeria. The colonial service did not underestimate the significance of dogs as co-imperialists. While it was difficult for, the Brit for British men to receive approval to bring their wives to the colony during the early stages of colonial project. There seems to be, there seems to be no objection to bringing dogs. So at that point in time, it was actually easier to bring dogs than to bring wives or spouses. The restriction on bringing female partners due to lack of modern facilities and the demand for colonial service might, in, might have actually increased the popularity of dog companionship. And that's another argument of, I made in the book that it would, it would appear that more and more early colonial officers 
brought dogs because they couldn't bring their wives. That doesn't mean that they were not bringing dogs by the 1940s when they were allowed to bring in their wives. Of course, they continued to bring dogs, but I would argue that it's, it appears that the policy against bringing women at the early stages of colonialism was partly responsible for the for dog companionship, dog colonial companionship. From all indication, the colonial service was a dog friendly one, partly because care for dogs did not interfere in a meaningful way with the daily life and schedule of the colonial officers, even with the principles of colonialism. Until, unlike other animals such as horses, dogs required minimal traveling arrangement and space. Many vessels would allow dogs to share the same space with their owners. Private and government rent houses and hotels tended to welcome dogs. This meant that upon arriving in Nigeria, dogs could easily be integrated into colonial life. And that is what I've I discovered. Uh, this is, of course, changed over the course of colonialism. By the 1940s and the 50s, dogs were being transported through play. But at the beginning, it was true vessels. Europeans and other classes of foreigners who did not write about or documented things about their dogs, they did it with films. And we see a lot of that. Even by the 1940s, we begin to see film footage of dogs. And all this was really very important for those who believe that their dogs deserve uh, some kinds of uh, respect for being part of the colonial enterprise. And this dog is uh, called Tr uh, Tris uh, Trix Trizzi. Um, the owner was uh, a non-official uh, uh, European from Britain who came in the 1950s. So he is going to be one of the least, one of the last generation of uh, of dogs owned by Europeans in uh, in India. And what is fascinating about this dog is that unlike previous generation of dogs who came in the first decade or the second decade of the 20th century, he lived a much more modern world. It was everywhere. Uh, Trixie was everywhere. He was in cinema houses with his owner. He was in, you know, this is the, this is, uh, it, this is actually the Kano airport waiting for his boss, you know, from, from abroad. It was everywhere. It was, this is, I mean, this is a staff club with pool. And this is the where the Gurara fall in Northern Nigeria. So now I'm going to change the course of this presentation and begin to lay out some structures. Let me see. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think I can still do this in 15 minutes. So, um, when we think about animals as diasporic bodies, one of the things I really want to be able to think about is that when animals move, one of the first things that changes about them is their daily routines and their food. We see this in the case of Aruna and Imadi, who were captured. They were captured as babies in, in Cameroon. And on arriving in, in, uh, in the zoo, the first process would be, how do they adjust to food? Uh, they arrived at a point in time when zoological knowledge was still in its infancy at the, at the Bado Zoo. And the earlier zoologists from their biographies, from their autobiographies, explained a lot about the problem of feeding these animals. It was trial and error to actually create a, a new home for animals captured and brutalized from, from, from the wild. So when I think about animals as their spirit body, I, I want to be able to think about the ways in which these animals are able to adjust to new environments. And this new environment itself is always a changing environment. For example, a dog brought from Britain can arrive in Lagos within two days, only to move to the plane, to the train, all the way to Kano. The environment in, in Kano is not the same. The climate in Kano is not the same as the climate in Lagos. And so, what? So, when I think about animals and the, the way they are moving, I want to be able to think about how these changes and transformations shape their own existence themselves, how the ways in which they're able to adjust to transformations across physical boundaries, and of course, across cultural boundaries. The second part of it is that when we talk about laws and institutions in African studies, we always assume that these laws and institutions are always about humans. So such decades and decades of scholarship on African law and legal system have actually sidelined or overlooked the roles that laws play in shaping animal lives. 
There were lots of animals, lots of animal bodies, movement of animals, when to kill animals, how not to kill animals, uh, cruelty towards animals. So, and I want to see these laws, these human-made laws and institutions as significant factor in shaping animals' movement. So, for example, an animal can actually be killed or impounded if found outside during a rabies outbreak. And so, it, for me, I'm going to think about this kind of law as a law that has to do with the transformations that animals have to deal with. So, an animal coming from a place without rabies could actually become a, a diseased body if it arrived in a community where rabies is ongoing. And this happened a lot. Uh, it is not impossible for uh, for someone to bring in a dog, for example, from London, only for the person to be told that your dog cannot be outside because there's a rabies outbreak going on. And that same animal can now become a deceased body, impounded and even killed because. So I want to see the aspect, not just about the questions of um, of movement, the questions of food, the question of changes and transformation and adaptation to nature, as also the changes in an adaptation to human made laws. Another example we can have is that when we look at the map of Africa, we see that different colonial regimes have different conservation laws. And these different conservation laws are about animals as much as about humans. Movement of animals across artificial colonial boundaries. So that in some parts of Africa, an animal can be a protected species because the British, the Germans, or whoever, or the French thought that it is going under, it is going through extinction. This same animal may lose its protection, is a conservation protection, if it moves outside another physical, artificial colonial boundary. So I want to see the ways in which the movement of animals within artificial boundaries, colonial boundaries, uh, you know, relate directly to the questions of law and order. And in terms of why those animals move, from the stories I've just said, given now, so we know that most of them, they move the voluntary. So uh, Aruna and Imadi were captured so, you know, from, from Cameroon and brought to Nigeria. Um, uh, Mary and Logia were, you know, were you know, land cops, also captured from the wild. But this time, they were brought to, to the UK and of course, uh, Chris and Bunje, under in a different situation, were brought from the United Kingdom and imported into South Southeast Africa. So most of the animals were were uh, were moving involuntarily, but at the same time, some of them were moving voluntarily. So I think that when we think uh, or write or, or try to study animals as their spirit bodies, we can also begin to look at the circumstances of their movement. We know that the dogs, of course, we know moved because their owners moved. But we also understand that this movement or the condition for their movement is not always, it's not always cast in stone. So it's possible for an animal to move initially voluntarily only for it to experience some forms of involuntary movement. And this is the case of uh, runaway animals. It happened a lot. Uh, it happened a lot. Animals who ran away from their owners and lived you know, free, if you would like. You know the so-called feral canine, and that was that was common. And the voluntary part also involves the process through which what began as involuntary transforms as voluntary, and of course goes back to involuntary. And this happens when animals moved, especially from ethnic uh, lines, because all over Nigeria, as we know in other parts of the country, uh, perception towards animals vary. And an animal can actually enjoy certain forms of freedom in one ethnic location and, of course, become a diseased body or a criminal element in other parts of, of the country. And we see that again in the, in the question of dogs. Dogs in Islamic society, the, the perception about dog in Islamic society is completely different from the perception of dog in non-Islamic society, especially in the Middle East. These are the ways to think about animals, especially for the question of movement and migration. We can also talk about uh, symbolic materiality when we think about animals as diasporic bodies. Um, we can talk specifically in capitalist form. Uh, Prince and Bunje, for example, were, you know, cattle brought to Nigeria to increase yield. You know, it was just economic, it was material, it was capitalism. Uh, they thought those animals would produce 
you know, they would, you know, they would produce new cows that would initiate a genealogy of massive cows that could serve multiple purposes, meat, milk, hide and skin, and of course, transport animal. So in some cases, the movement is basically economic. And like I said earlier, although the experiment failed, the, the Prince and Bunje experiment failed, but this did not stop veterinarians from um, from 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 active uh, actively importing metropolitan stock or even stock from other parts of Africa and that is the photo I, I was showing you earlier and you know what is now very interesting for me that in the 1950s and the 60s uh, African nationalists were defining uh, progress and uh, nation building uh, in terms of the sizes of animals the, the extravagant sizes of cattle there's, there was a, this kind of connection between food sustenance and nation building, and that the, the bigger cattle, the bigger the cattle you can produce, the, the more sustainable the drive towards the nation building. I love that part of the manuscript because it allows me to place animals at the center of the discourse of nation building, what I think most scholars don't really think about. But when I do that, I'm also much, I'm also very interested in looking at the origins of those animals. The animals were not just from Nigerian animals, they were animals from all over the world, you know, integrated into the Nigerian animal population, all because of material and what they can produce, you know, uh, for their material good. The other part is to look at it from question of wildlife and fantasy. And that's what we see in the story of Aruna and Imadi. The Aruna and Imadi were not going to be killed and consumed for meat. They were going to be basically, uh, they were going to be uh, exhibited uh, for human enjoyment, uh, exhibited in zoos. And so for me, that part is also interesting to see the ways in which animals like uh, like Arun and, and of course Loja and Prince, for them it was just animals for, for. So when we think about animals as their spirit bodies, I think it would be nice for us to look at the materials or symbolic materiality, uh, what they were captured for and the roles they played, where they came from and how their, uh, their movement transformed the ways humans engage with them. So in the case of zoo, the zoo provided a so-called safe space for humans to encounter nature. The last button list in this category will be companionship. But dogs are not brought to Nigeria for 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 wildlife fantasy or for for for, for consumption. We were brought for as companions. So when we think about animals as diasporic body, we can probably start thinking about ways in which these animals are serve as companions. I use dog because dogs are, you know, the so-called best friends of humans, and they're just the best example to illustrate, uh, to, to illustrate migration, or how animals shape migratory behavior, or the ways in which animals help humans to live a specific life in the diaspora. So that when we think and talk about human life, how people live away from home, we can also think about the animals that allowed them to live away from home something allowed them to be away from home. So if we, as we know, it could be about religion. We know religion a lot. We know identities and culture. We know food is significant to the discourse of diaspora. But I think for a long time, scholars have not been talking about how animals help humans to live away from home. And, and this also goes back to the questions of even humans. Uh, transport, trans, transformation, uh, diaspora, as we know, have shaped and transformed, have you know, expanded human uh, human, uh, you know, I'm looking for the right word. Maybe we can look at different ways in which migration have shaped human existence, if that would be the right word. Because all these animals coming in and out of Nigeria were initiating new genealogies in terms of crossbreeding and procreation. And for me, we need to be talking about that. Uh, the animals that we consume today is not the one they consumed 100 years ago. The genes of the animals that we have today is not the same gene that they had 200 years ago. It is migration that made all this possible. So for example, from the 1940s, Nigerians began to keep dogs as pets. Historically, most Africans keep dogs as utility. They call them utility animals. And by utility, what they mean is the animals used for hunting, animals used for security, animals used for sacrifice to the gods. You can't for most people believe that a dog in African world, you cannot be a pet. Pet within the context of European culture, like an animal that has no job, you know, that kind of thing, you know, that was a stereotype. You know, animal that lives in the home with the boss, 
All he does is just to sit on the couch. So the point in emphasis is that the movement of these animals you know, transform the animals as a, spirit, as a biological being in terms of breeding and procreation. And this transformation itself also shaped the ways in which human engaged with them. So for the first time, Nigerians in the 1940s began to keep dogs as pets. And this did not happen before, for the 40s and the 50s. So Lag Lagosians, people living in Portaco, people li living in Ibado, Nigerians living in big cities began to adopt animals, began to adopt uh, dogs as pets. And this was happening because of the inroad of foreign exotic dog into Nigeria. And it was also happening because of a consistent experiment in terms of uh, crossbreeding of animals. I would like to see this crossbreeding, mixed breeding procreation as part of diasporic discourses and, 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 and animal life. And of course, I won't waste too much time here. In terms of periodization, we can begin to look at animal movement and diaspora before the colonial period. Uh, we can assume that animals were not leaving Nigeria or the place that would be called Nigeria or Africa or any parts before the colonial period. We don't even know if all these early explorers of Africa also brought animals from their own original location. So when we read the stories of explorers and travelers, missionaries, those who came before the 20th century, maybe we can have some insight into the kind of animals they brought. And we don't even know that as they traveled, maybe they were buying animals and adopting animals from one place to the other. The one we know very well is that we know they made use of horses and donkeys. And I did a little bit of that in the book, the ways in which donkeys helped the explorers. But, but we still need a lot of work to, to be done in looking at the ways in which pre-colonial societies traveling, migrations within and across the continent, both by Africans and non-Africans, shaped migration of animals. And more importantly, the interface between animals and humans. Then, of course, the colonial period is the area I just spoke about now and the post-colonial period. Yeah, I'm, I'm almost done. I think almost like we should be fine. Uh, so sources, um, historian, for me, I think scholars see what they want to see. Scholars see what they want to see. And what I mean is that in most cases when we do research, we tend to see what we program our mind to see. And we may not see a lot of things that are useful, but because, not because they're not useful, but because they're not what we're looking for. When I began to do this research, I was surprised to discover that archival materials have a lot of information about animal movement, their names, their biographies. I mean, all these stories I just told about Aruna and Imadi, about Mary and Loja, about Prince and Bunje, they're all in archival sources. So biographies of animals, their movement, their owners, even their medical records are all in the archive. From the 1940s, some Nigerians began to establish veterinary med medical practice. And we can trace the movement, the stories and histories of these animals, even from records of veterinary sciences in the, in, 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 in the, in the archive. So the sources include archival material. Like I said, it's not because those things are not there. Materials are there, it's just because we're not thinking in that perspective. And of course, newspapers. Um, newspaper carried so much information about animals, biographies. In fact, there's a particular section in the book on horse racing, which I, I would say I wrote predominantly from newspapers. Horse racing was a very important thing uh, for the colonial government, and of course, I'm not going to talk too much about that. But it's actually possible to read the biographies of animals in the newspapers, and with this time around, specific focus on on us racing. And of course, in scientific journals, yes, West African uh, Journal of Medicine carried a lot of stories about African animals from the 40s and 50s. These are academic journals, but if we look into them, we see a lot of information about animals. So let me, how would I like to compute? I think that um, I, I'm not making a claim that I'm the first scholar to, to ask for the integration of animals into the discourse of African diaspora. But I think um, I'm, I'm, I, I, I could be the first to try to provide some structure to do this in a much more elaborate form. And this is important for me because when I, when I was writing the book, I couldn't resist the narratives of movement and migration, the narrative of, of adaptation. The, the narratives that challenged me to see 
animals as an as animals as integral component of the making of communist societies. And this movement again is not just about uh, just physical movement. They are movement that shapes cultural identities, and that is why I think that. The, one of the reasons may be we've not been reading a lot about animals as diasporic bodies is because we can actually write the history of African diaspora without reference to animals. It is possible. We can write about African diaspora without animals, but we cannot write about, about animals diaspora without humans. And, that's, and because animal history or human animal history is still very much in its infancy, when I say human animal history, I am not talking about this time about hunting or imperial or local hunting, which has formed the basis of many scholarship. And of course, I am not talking about the dense trove of scholarship on nature conservation coming out from Eastern and Southern Africa. It's possible for you to write a book on nature conservation even without talking about animals. And that is one of the problems about the scholarship on nature conservation in Eastern and Southern Africa. Scholarship that has nothing to do with animals, even though it's about animals. Scholarship that talks only about humans as the makers of landscape through nature conservation laws, but not about the animals themselves who move around and across. So the point in emphasis as I conclude is that I think that the reason we have not been having dedicated rigorous scholarship on animals as diasporic bodies is because, first, the scholarship on human animal relations in Africa is still in its infancy, and you cannot study the animals as diasporic bodies without actually studying human animal relations. And it's also because of the fact that for a long time, people assume that humans are the only makers of history. One of the things I did in the book is to argue that the past of African society was not made by humans alone. If we redefine what constitutes history and what constitutes makers of history, then we can begin to see animals as not only parts of the making of the past, but as an active agent in the transformations of society. So if we look at a dog, if we think about Aruna and Imadi, these are gorillas who shaped childhood history in significant ways. They are the standpoint or the beginning for even thinking about many family stories. For me, I want to see those animals as makers of history. So if we restore agency into the lives of history, just as if just as we have restored agency in the study of women, the way we have restored agency in the studies of minority ethnic group or, or communities that have been sidelined in history, we can restore this same agency in the story of animals. And once we do that, then we can begin to see animals beyond uh, being, beyond, beyond uh, non-human creatures that we eat, that serves as companion, and that uh, motivates us to rethink our own understanding of what constitutes uh, or what constitutes uh, superiority between humans and non-humans. Thank, thank you for your time. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Dorinto. That was super interesting, and I loved some of the, the photographs that you shared with us. Um, as a reminder, um, you can post questions um, in the Q and A. You can type them, or you can raise your hand, and I will unmute you, and you can ask the question yourself if you like. Um, as people are gathering their thoughts, I just just one observation. Your your presentation brought to mind, particularly the part about dogs as companions, brought to mind the title of one of the um, um, sort of memoirs written by Albert Cook, who was uh, one of the most prominent medical missionaries in East Africa. He worked in Uganda. One of his memoirs is, in, is titled um, A Doctor and His Dog in Uganda. And um, the fact that I actually know the name of his dog, which was Dick, is an indication of the extent to which that dog is everywhere in this memoir. He writes about him all the time. Uh, and, and like you mentioned, that was not uncommon. There are many in the memoirs of missionaries from this early period. It was very common to write a lot about your dogs as, as companions. Um, so, okay, so I'm going to open this up now. I already see we have a couple of questions in the um, Q&A, and I'll start with those. And then um, please raise your hand or, or type additional questions. And the first one was from um, Pulumi uh, Polajimi. I'm not sure if everyone can see these, so I'll just read it quickly. The question is, um, dear Professor Dorinto, thanks for your illuminating presentation. You said that Africans started 
accommodating dogs as companions in the 1940s, unlike the earlier years when dogs were used as utility animals. My question, are, is there evidence to prove that dogs did not play the dual roles of companionship and utility in pre-colonial um, West Africa or Nigeria? My old and late grandfather used his dogs as companions and helping hunters. Okay, good. Yeah, so I, I think I said the word pets, not companions. So the utility dogs, historically, is a dog that, in quote unquote, has a job. And so what is the job? Uh, for hunting, for security, uh, for sacrifice to the gods, and for companions. So dogs have historically been companions. And the utility dog, the so-called pre-colonial dog, and that's what I did in the book. There is this so-called, uh, there's, there's a so-called pre-colonial dog. And these pre-colonial dogs, they're not just dogs because they've been around before colonialism. They were dogs of a particular breed, the so-called local African dogs. And you know, some of the problems about um, genetics is to assume that these dogs all look alike. They look alike, but they don't have the same gene. Over the centuries, there's a lot of mixing, but they call them local dogs. So when you go to any part of Nigeria, even to today, people would say that is a local dog. Now, so they have always been companions. Now, what I said, from the 1940s is a dog as a pet. Now, it's about language, which is problematic. So a pet dog is socially constructed as most cases, a jobless dog. So what does it mean as a jobless? These are dogs not used for hunting because the owners are in the city. They're exotic dogs. These are dogs that cannot even walk five miles. So they are, they are not the kind of dog you take to the jungle for hunting. These are always small dogs that cannot do the job of hunting. And of course, they are not sacrificial dogs. These are not the gods to be sacrificed to the god of Hion that consumes the blood of dog, dogs. So the pet concept of a dog is one, a dog that shares the same space, in most cases, with the owner. A dog that almost will eat exactly what the owner is eating. So the utility dog in most cases would eat leftovers. And in fact, when the government was making laws against, against large breeding of domestic dogs, people argue that their dogs help them in sanitation because the, 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 the feces of children, deaths and everything, this is the, what the dogs consume. So when we're talking about a pet dog, we're talking about a dog you would take to the, to the to the cinema. In the book, I started a chapter in the book about, about a pet dog that was taken to the cinema. You're not going to take a utility dog to the cinema, and that's how they do it. So the, the, in a nutshell, not to take your time, dogs have always been companion. So companionship is a significant element of what makes dog human's best friend. The second part is pet, which is about class, which is about location, which is about race. It's an urban culture among educated Nigerians who began to keep exotic dogs as pets. And this, the, the idea of a pet basically means an animal, quote unquote, that is jobless. These are not even security animals anyway. Some of them can serve as security or help, but most of them are not, that's not their job. Their job is to sit on the same car with their boss. Their job is to go, so, and that is why I was showing you the photos of Trixel. Trisha was everywhere with the owner, everywhere. And the life of Trisha can give an idea of what makes a pet dog a pet dog. And last but not the least, what I've just described is not out of order in 21st century Lagos or Nigeria or Ibadu. When we go to Nigeria today, what I'm saying is clear to everyone. Some dogs are pets. <laughs> you know, we know what, when we see a pet dog, we know a pet dog. When we go to the villages and the rural community, when we see the so-called street dog, a pet dog cannot be a street dog. And we know what is problematic about being called a street dog. And all the, you know, you know, we know how a street dog looks. And we know how a pet dog looks. Thank you. Um, I have another question here um, from the Q&A from Bennett McIntosh. Thank you for arguing so well for the inclusion of animals in historical narratives. We were wondering about the idea of dogs as co-agents of imperialism. What does the entanglement framework have to say about the tension between this idea and the fact that the dogs were not voluntarily consensually playing their co-agent role? Yes, they were not, but they know when they get to that role. So the way it works is that 
they were proxies for negotiating racial boundaries. In the book, I told a story, a very bad story anyway, of a 1952 story of, uh, they call it the dog bite case, when um, a white expatriate unleashed his dog on an African and, you know, and it went to court. It was a big case in Lagos. It's called, it's called uh, the dog case, the dog bite, a very big case, which transformed into a nationalist discourse. It became a big problem. And uh, nationalists were over it. Uh, critics of colonialism were over it. The question is simple. Can people teach their dogs to act in certain ways to certain people? So these dogs did not come willingly. But when they arrive on the continent, they automatically enjoy all the rights and privileges of their owners. And with time, it is not, it is not difficult for these dogs to realize their privileged position. This privileged position includes the way they react to certain peoples as they have been taught by their owners. See, dogs are non-human agents capable of translating humans' understanding of their own biases in rhythms. And the example I just gave, the dog bite case is an example. You know, when that case was being held in the court, the big question was this, was this dog naturally angry towards everyone, or was this dog just angry towards the black man? And in the long run, they brought in veterinarians, they brought in scientists to, to this case. It was in the 1950s, and I wrote about it in the book. The, the debate in the, uh, I mean, the, the final conclusion was that even though this dog was pregnant, this dog acted the way it acted because his boss told him and taught him to bite black people. So when I say dogs as co-agent of imperialism, this is what I mean. When they move with their owners, they enjoy all the privileges of their owners. And they themselves understand their own status within the colonial society. And in the book, another thing I didn't mention why I was giving my opinion is that I made it, I tried to demarcate between colonial dogs and something problematic, white dogs. Another problem, you know, which I tried to explain, and of course the problematics. So the, the point in emphasis. Uh, generally, is that although these animals, these dogs, this co-agent of imperialism moved involuntarily, they were brought here, but their entire life, their entire story, their movement all helped them to acquire certain roles and obligations that actually transformed them into co-agents of imperialism. The, the last example I'm going to give is when there's rabies. When the rabies is this deadly disease and all dogs have found on the streets have to be have to be rounded up and killed. If you want to know a privileged dog who is the owner of a dog, is when a dog is captured during rabies outbreak. Dogs of Europeans captured during rabies outbreak are more likely going to be released than dogs of Africans captured during rabies outbreak. Even if they're going to be observed for seven days, they're likely going to be well fed in a very good uh, dog kennel than the Africans. And so that is where you begin to see that the lives they live itself is the privileged life of their owners. And if they live the life of their owners, there's no reason why we shouldn't call them co-agents of imperialism. Thank you. Um, next question is from Prince Vincent Tanen. Uh, my question, this is a very interesting seminar. Uh, from all indications, this appears to be the first um, study of its kind. Um, and he's asking about um, the sorts of primary sources that you rely upon. Are there some methodological challenges that you encountered? And if there are, I'm interested in knowing how these challenges shaped the way the book was written. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, when I write my books, my books, uh, my books don't, uh, I don't write the books, the books write me. So what that means, and I state this categorically in all my the books I've written, that I follow my data. I follow the directions. I don't go with preconception. Even if I go with preconception, I'm always very flexible to allow data to, to win, to allow the subject to win, to allow the narratives of the people I meet to win. So in other words, I'm more concerned about what the data is telling me and my ability to represent the data in its best possible form. 
So the, in the book, I express some of the methodological challenges. And one of the methodological challenges, what shapes the kind of animals you write about? So I didn't write about all animals. I wrote about the us. I wrote about the us and the donkey. I wrote about the dog. I wrote about the cattle. I wrote about wildlife. But I left so many other animals out. For example, I didn't write about birds. I didn't write about uh, snakes. I didn't write. No, I wrote about snakes a little bit. But I didn't write about fish. So now, the first question is going to be: Why did you decide to focus on one kind of animals and not on other animals? The answer could be one: sources. If I have a dense trove of data. On one kind, on one type of animal, I'm definitely going to write more about that type of animal because I have more sources to write about those. Excuse me, to write about that particular animal. The other point is going to be the, the dynamics of the data itself. What the data is saying, and you know, following the data. And so, the other challenge will be to learn vocabularies. Uh, because each animal has its own unique experience. The dogs has their own experience in terms of vocabulary, in terms of life, to understand them as, 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 as active agents in the production of history. Uh, how do I write about horses and, and see the place of us as an active agent of history? Each of these animals have different forms of agency. So the way I'm going to position the dog as an important element in the making of modern Nigeria. It's not the way I would I position the horse. The horse was the most aristocratic animal, but it was not just one horse. There's a difference between a race horse, there's a difference between a double horse, there's a difference between a walking horse. How would I write about these categories of animals without, uh, without disrespecting the, the significant roles they played in history? The same applied to the wildlife. So, the, I mean, I can keep talking forever about the methodological and theoretical challenges. But of course, the book is going to be out. So I would encourage Prince to wait for <laughs> wait for it. And we have enough time forever to talk about theoretical and methodological challenges. But the short answer I would give is that my, my data writes my book. I don't write them. What that basically means is that I'm more concerned about what the data is telling me. And the trajectory they would take is always going to be a function of what the data is saying and less of what I want to do. I don't impose my own understanding of anything on what data is. And I think that is for most historians, not me alone. Thank you. I think your answer to that question um, leads us well into the next question from Ed Poe. Um, and he, he's, he asks, uh, we all know that the transfer of different plants as food sources from one region to another has created significant changes in the receptive region. The transfer of the horse to the west of the United States was also significant, particularly for the Plains Indians. Can you think of any other animal transfer that affected Africa in an important way? Yeah, so all the animals I spoke about transformed Africa. For example, the horse. Uh, 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 all horse racing was the horse racing was the number one sport in in colonial Nigeria. It was a national sport, and of course. There was the local horses, but over time, you see a lot of experimentation to get what they call uh, we got what they call fast blood. These are you know us thoroughbred horses that can run fast. So what happened in Nigeria in most cases during the colonial period is the importation of new breeds to enhance the quality of existing ones, and they were enhancing them because these animals were performing material and symbolic roles. For example, the cattle, introducing new breed of cattle to increase yield. For example, the horse, introducing new breed of horses to increase speed. So the period I'm, talking, I'm studying is a much more modern period. Now, I stated at the beginning of my lecture that the transformation of modern world is the story of migrations, the introduction of plants and animals, and that's has happened. So it's only archeologists who can tell us when all these animals arrived, where they, where they arrived. So archeologists could say that this is when dogs came to Africa. And I've read a lot of things about that. And they can say the first us came to Africa from this. And we can continue to have this debate about which animal is original to Africa. But I don't have the language, I don't have the training to talk about the prehistory of these animals. The, the training I have and based on my data is to talk about these animals in the 20th century and to also argue that from 1900 to 1960, we know that the local stock expanded tremendously 
as a result of colonialism. And this was happening through mixed breeding, and the mixed breeding was taking place because animals have diverse material and symbolic roles. Thank you. Um, we have another question from Bennett McIntosh. Um, you mentioned veterinarians a few times. Did you see a connection between the colonial human medical enterprise and colonial veterinary medicine? Should we regard these two areas of expertise and their role in the colonial project as more connected than previous medical histories might? Um, I'll just add on one, um, one additional question there that came to my mind. Um, we might also think of um, the role of animals in medical research and that the medical sciences, I'm thinking of the colonial period here, um, if you if you sort of read archival sources um, about medical research and the medical sciences um, in many parts of Africa during the colonial period, um, one of the things that you'll be struck by, as you, you probably know, is the circulation of animals used to, in the conduction of this research. And what strikes me in particular is um, this, the, I've been reading a lot about um, this in Western Uganda, for instance, the extent to which monkeys were brought from South Asia to East Africa and West Africa as well, I know. And the volume with which they were brought really struck me. I just assumed they would use monkeys in East Africa in this case because they were already there. But they were important, importing lots and lots of monkeys. And I never thought about the effect that that might have on sort of on, on the species themselves and on human populations as well. So I'm um, just just an addendum to Brendan McIntosh's question about the relationship between veterinary medicine and um, sort of the colonial medical enterprise and the, and animals. Yeah. So good question. So um, one of the critiques I have about the current st states of knowledge on medical history is that medical history of Africa is essentially human medicine. Now, and unfortunately, there's a lot to gain from scholarship that interfaces with veterinary history and veterinary medicine or animal medicine. Animal medicine of Africa and human medicine are not communicated. So I, so sometime last year, one of my mentees, who is actually meant to apply to Wisconsin, but unfortunately uh, he couldn't get his transcript, was going to write or work on veterinary medicine of Nigeria for the first time. Colonial. I don't know of anyone who has ever worked on Nigerians' animal medicine or veterinary medicine. My book has sections on vet medicine, on rabies, on rinderpex, but it's not enough. I can tell you that we can actually have 10 people 10 PhD students working simultaneously on Nigeria's veterinary medicine and not even have to interface with one another, just to show you how much data that we have that we are not working with. So two questions here. One, the African medical history is not just history of human medicine. As you have rightly mentioned, Professor Kodesh, many times animals were imported to aid scientific research into human medicine. That part itself is on the exp explored. We are actually not even talking about that. The ways in which early experimentation into dreadful diseases were carried out through veterinary sciences. That's number one. The number two part is that there is practically no components of human medical science that cannot be connected to animal science. Because whether it's in terms of treatment of human diseases or in terms of causation. So for example, we, we study diseases of humans, but we don't study what causes it. So these are, these are these are called zoonotic diseases. So we don't still don't, so how do you want to study rabies without studying dogs? So in a nutshell, I think that one of the limitations, and I've expressed this to a group of young PhD students who work on medical history of Nigeria, is a new group called Nigeria Medical History. It just came up with it last year. And I was asked to talk to them and advise them that I think that Nigeria's medical history is fascinating. We should work on it. But I think that the animal perspective to Nigeria medical history is fundamental. And that Nigeria medical history is not just about human medicine. Is also about animal medicine. So, so in, in, in to call the law, I mean to cap it all, I think that African veterinary medicine, 
that creates an interface. I don't want a medicine. So I'm not talking about a medical scholarship that's about animals alone, no. Because veterinarians are doing that. Even today, when you go to colleges of veterinary sciences in Nigeria, they study animals as animals. They, are, they don't study animals as animals' relations with humans. So my, I'm proposing a new body of scholarship, if it's new, I know I may not be the first to say this out, but anyway. So that animal science and human science should have an interface. And this should be done historically. So that the works produced by veterinarians, thousands and thousands of files in Kaduna archive, in the Ibada archive, in the Nugu archive, that no humans have ever touched, can speak directly to what we know about human myths. So, so last, for example, when I did the, the, so if you read the chapter I have on rabies, the chapter I have on rabies is, is, is about veterinary science as much as about human science and human medicine. And that's the way I, want, I would like it to be written. Thank you. We have time, I think, for one more question. And I see a question here from Jackie Bethamugwe. And it's um, following up on Prince's question about methods. And um, Jacqueline writes, as you spoke, I went into my Dropbox and looked at some of the primary sources I scanned from the archives in Cameroon and was very surprised to see how much conversation there is around animals and pets in 1960s Cameroonian newspapers and even government newsletters. I missed it all. Can you expand on the methodological approaches historians can use to understand better how animals can shape history um, like humans? Thank you for this great talk. Yeah, I, yeah, I think the first thing is to see animals as agents of history first. You know, I think it's it's like it's like it's like when our when our ancestors, academic ancestors, when our academic ancestors began to study women in the seventies, what started was a kind of a theoretical understanding that women are also agents of history. Then, of course, the data supported their claim, and their claim is valid. And now we have a series of brilliant scholarship that has fully restored women into, into historical agency. The same applies to animals. The first thing to think about is not, is not to, we would always come across all this information, but the first thing we should ask ourselves, can these guys, dogs, horses, can I, they actually have a role to play? And it is when we are convinced and we are able to look at agency from a more theoretical perspective, or we disrupt agency. For example, uh, it, it's, Part of it to disrupt agencies to say that if what happens if you have a race, a race horse, that what role can a race horse play in shaping humans' agency? And the question could have been maybe you should begin to look about the, the, the happiness it gives to people, the sorrow it gives to people, how it makes people happy. Or you can say that if there was no horse, can you have horse racing? And if there's no horse racing, then you can't have the most important sporting event that shaped colonial power. Horse racing was the most important sporting event for the British. It is the same event that the British used in reinforcing and instituting their own understanding of superiority or imperial power. So for me, my question is going to be, so this game called horse racing helped the British to highlight the significance of imperial domination. But what? But there's one thing that makes this thing happen. And what is it? The horse. And so then, then my conversation begins not from us racing and the humans. It begins from who are these horses? How do they, did they do? What did they do? And how is it that what they were doing, what they were, how did what they were doing shape human understanding of power? And that, in that way, I'm writing an animal history of horse racing, not a human history of horse racing. The same applied to dog. You can you have the option of saying, this is a dog and this is a human. But it is when I begin to say that what kind of things is important? That what are the things that this dog is doing that shape human existence? And can this thing exist without human? So for example, dog and sacrifice. There's, an, there's a Yoruba dog, there's a Yoruba god called Ogun. This Ogun consumes dog. You, you, it, it is a dog. It is a, it's a, it's an animal that you that you is a god that you, that is you, is a dog that is a, is a god that is uh, that is worshipped with animals with, with with a dog. The question for me is going to be that Ogun would not exist without dog, and that means that dog is very very important. 
for good to exist. So for me, the question, and, and like I said, I can continue to talk forever about, about this, for me is to flip the narrative. It's not to come from the human perspective, but to come from the animal perspective. And once I do that, everything appears clear to me. Okay, thank you. Um, we're already a little bit over time, and I really respect everyone's time, but I particularly want to thank um, Saeed for this really interesting presentation and this great conversation following. We really appreciate you taking the time to do this, especially virtually, and we hope to um, have you here in Madison in person in the, in the near future once things, once things back to some semblance of normality. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.